Okay, this is the first lecture for kinetics. This is really the first half, um, or really two thirds of this unit for chapter 13. Um, and we are gonna jump in. So um, I have, I'm gonna start with like, what is chemical kinetics? That's what this chapter is on. So when you think of kinetics, you usually think of how fast things are happening, right? So that's, it's really how fast chemical reactions are happening. So chemical kinetics is the study of, let's get my pen is the study of reaction rates, how fast those chemical reactions happen. Sometimes we need to speed up chemical reactions for reasons you can probably think of. Um, chemical kinetics is also important because it can shine light on how a reaction happens. So also can shed light on mechanisms. This is going to be an important word later. So mechanisms is like how the chemical reaction happens. Are there different steps? Is there just one step? Uh, that kind of thing. So um, I have an example here of an iodine clock reaction, which is based on chemical kinetics that I want to show you guys really quick. Okay, so this video is a reaction that I would love to demonstrate in class, but since we're not together, I wanted to show you a picture. Essentially, it's two different solutions, two different reactions for a chemical reaction that's gonna happen and produce something. So watch this. Okay, so um, essentially what this example showed you is that you can change the speed of a chemical reaction and we can actually learn a lot from it. So let me There we go. Okay, so um, what is a reaction rate? It's essentially the rate at which the reaction occurs, right? But rate at which, what is happening when a reaction occurs? Well, the reactants are gonna be used up and we're gonna make the product. So it's really the rate at which the reactants disappear and the rate at which the products appear. If that's really what we're watching happen, okay? Um, so essentially, if we're, we're wanting things to be produced and things to be used up, the rate is gonna be the change in the molarity, because it's usually for solutions, over the change in time, okay? So concentration over time. So the units for rate are usually be going to be molarity per second or molarity per minute, or depends on how fast the reaction happens, right? So you're usually gonna see molarity per second. Okay, so I mentioned mechanisms at the beginning up here. So like, what is a mechanism? Well, it's exactly how the reaction occurs. Exactly how the reaction occurs. And what I mean by that is there are, there could be multi-steps okay, for a chemical reaction to occur. Um, there could be different molecule collisions. Different molecules have to actually collide in order for a reaction to occur. Um, the Krebs cycle over here is an example of that. So if you end up uh, taking a biochemistry class, um, there are all kinds of mechanisms that you would learn about. One of them being the Krebs cycle, which is essentially important to the human body. And it's got eight different steps. So there's a bunch of intermediates. Um, sometimes they're sped up by catalysts. Um, but the mechanism is actually eight different steps for that reaction to occur. So um, rates of the reaction, how do we actually change the rate of a reaction? Um, well, first of all, you have to know what you need for a reaction to occur. occur and that's um, something based on what's called collision theory. You have to actually have molecules collide for them to react, which should make sense. It's actually two things you need for a successful chemical reaction to occur or a successful collision. Well, first of all, they have to actually collide, but they have to collide correctly. So they have to collide with the correct orientation. If they have the wrong orientation, meaning like they're not turned the right way, 
they're not going to react correctly. You're not going to be able to make the new bonds that you need to. So they have to have the correct orientation when they collide, and they also have to have the correct or enough energy in order to collide. If they just brush past each other, they're not going to react. But if they have enough energy, then they will react. And you might have heard of this term before, but that energy is called the activation energy, or EA. So they have to have enough energy. Okay, so how do we speed up a reaction? There's actually multiple ways. And I really love this video that I'm going to show you really quick on how to speed up chemical reactions.
Okay, so this kind of sums up all of the ways that we can increase a chemical reaction. Um, I put the four main types here. We kind of combine two of them when we're talking about them, the surface area part. But um, concentration, of course, if you have more stuff um, in a smaller space, you're going to be able to have more of those collisions. So increasing the concentration essentially allows more particles to collide, so more collisions. More particles equals more collisions. Okay. Um, the other one is surface area. Like you said, if you grind it up, you get more surface area, you're going to be able to have more successful collisions. Um, that's also if things are in the same state, is usually liquids work best, um, or essentially the more homogeneous it is, right? The more well mixed it is, the more surface area something has, um, you're going to be able to get more collisions. So more homogeneous or more. I'm going to put SA for surface area means more contact or collisions. Oops, means more contact between those particles or collisions. Okay, temperature, uh, you said was analogous to things moving faster, right? The higher temperature, the faster the particles move. So if the particles are moving faster, so molecules moving faster. So we're going to have more collisions and more collisions that have enough activation energy. Okay. And finally, a catalyst. We talked about how a catalyst speeds up a reaction by orienting the molecules correctly. Um, so what that's doing is actually providing a different or easier mechanism. Speeds up reaction. Let's see. A new mechanism. Um, or it lowers the activation energy. Essentially, it's an easier mechanism, okay? Um, one important thing to note, and you probably learned this in biology, is that catalysts are not used up. Okay? They can be used over and over and over and over. That's why a matchmaker is actually a really good analogy. Okay, so moving on to section 3.2, how do we actually measure the rates of these reactions? You guys will be doing that in one of your first labs. Um, it's the same as like if you were in a car and I wanted to measure the rate at which you are moving. It's the distance over time, right? So instead we're going to measure the concentration over time, which should change. Um, so there's two things we could find regarding rate. You could find the average rate, okay? So if you do your beginning and your ending speed over the time that you were moving, um, that will tell you your average rate. Um, or you can find your instantaneous rate, okay? So average rate is essentially just the change in concentration over the change in time. Okay, whereas the instantaneous rate is really found using calculus, right? Found with calculus. It has to do with it's the tangent line at a specific instance, right? You look at tangent lines. Now I'm not going to make you guys do the calculus, but you should be able to draw a tangent line. Um, to tell me what the instantaneous rate would be. Okay, um, another important thing to note is that reaction rates are stoichiometric. And what that means is you have to have the balanced equation and they are actually related to each other. So if I'm looking at this reaction, actually the rate of appearance of B actually matches the rate of disappearance of A. And what that means is this reaction is just a one-to-one -one ratio, A turning into B. So if I were to write the what the rate is, I would write that the change in A, concentration of A, over the change in time. Okay, and it's actually disappearing, so that's why I'm making it negative. So that must have been my reactant. Um, and it's actually the same as the appearance of B. So B is going to be positive change in concentration over change in time. And again, they are the same because this is a one-to-one -one ratio if I write out this reaction. Now, if it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, the rates aren't going to be exactly the same. For example, if it was a one-to-two ratio, then we would see maybe the products appearing at double the rate that the reactants are disappearing. Okay, so in this specific instance, these rates are equal, again, because they have the um, same coefficient. They're a one-to-one -one ratio. So I could write that the rate is equal to 
negative concentration of A over the change of concentration or change of time, which is also equal to the positive change in concentration of B over change in time. Okay, and what I want you to notice is I've actually written a generic rate formula, like to calculate rates based on the stoichiometry um, right here. So this is kind of how it works for a generic reaction, meaning generic reaction being coefficient of A times concentration of A plus little b, b makes C plus D and D. So the negative ones are the reactants, right? Reactants disappear. Positive ones are the products, products up here. Um, and then I want you to notice the little a, little b, little c, and little d down here. These guys right here are the coefficients in the balanced reaction. So this will account for those changes in ratios, okay? So if they have a one to two ratio, that the rates will be, um, one will be halved or one will be doubled depending on how you're looking at it, okay? So we'll apply this in some different situations. Um, so I'm looking at this example right here. Now notice these are all, this is a one to one to one to one ratio. Okay, now over time, so what I did in the lab is I did this reaction and I monitored the rate of disappearance of this reactant over time. So over time, the concentration went down, right, which is what we would expect. Um, and the rate, so I found the rate for each, what is that, 50 seconds. So after 50 seconds, so the change in concentration over 50 seconds is this. And I, I did it as time went on. So if you notice in this specific reaction, the rate is decreasing over time. It's going slower and slower and slower, which would make sense, right? Because I'm using up my reactant. So as I have less and less of it, my rate is going to slow down. So what is happening to the rate over time? It is slowing. As those reactants get used up, then it's going to slow down over time. So I graphed this right here. Um, and when I was talking about tangent lines earlier, I have those drawn on here, the instantaneous rate. Um, this would be my initial instantaneous rate, like I drew a tangent line right there. Um, uh, the rate at 600 seconds would be the tangent line drawn here. So you should be able to find the rate at a specific time based on tangent lines. Okay, now what would you expect the graph to look like if the ratio was not one-to-one? -one? So notice, remember up here, this is a one-to-one -one ratio. If I drew a graph, or I'm just going to sketch a graph here, for something that's not one-to-one, -one, I would be like, okay, well, if this one disappears, or sorry, appears at a certain rate. Um, maybe this one is disappearing at a much faster rate. Okay, and you should be able to tell that that's faster because of this decrease, this in slope, or this very, very drastic change in slope, right? So a one-to-one -one ratio is not going to have the same slope. It's going to change, okay? This one is actually decreasing at a faster rate maybe twice as fast or three times as fast if we actually put numbers on it. Okay, so that's what the graph would kind of look like.